Well, good morning, Hope Church. How are we doing this morning? We doing all right? Man, we're so glad to have you with us. Everybody over in Mebane today, we're so excited to have you with us. Everybody at Hope Church online, everybody here in Burlington, man, we are so excited to have you with us. If you are new to Hope Church or if you are one of our returning family members who have maybe been MIA for the last uh, 14, 15 months, uh, you picked a great season to be with us. Um, 2020 definitely leveled the playing field for a church all across our globe. Um, I've been in ministry a really long time. I have a lot of pastor friends in ministry. I talk to pastors all over the country. And what I've discovered is last year, right, the church just kind of, man, got leveled out, right? And the cool part about the season we're in right now is that if you're joining us, you're actually part of locking arms with us and helping us rebuild God's church together. It really is an exciting season, right? It's really cool to be part of really building a church on a really healthy foundation. So if you wanna go on a journey with us, you've picked a great season to dig in and help us build God's church together. I think it's really cool just seeing what God's doing. In fact, last week here at Hope Church, we invited our Mebane family over to our Burlington location we had one big service together on Memorial Day weekend. It was awesome if you were here. We celebrated life change through baptism. How awesome was that? It was amazing, right? Uh, this place was packed to the walls. We ran out of chairs on the floor, we ran out of seats in the balcony, and it was awesome, right? It was amazing, right? And it was a reminder that God isn't finished with his church. In fact, he's just getting started. Why don't you turn to somebody right now at all of our locations and say, he's just getting started. Turn to somebody right now and say, he's just getting started. Come on, find somebody and yell it at them right now. Even if you're online, type it out. Say, he's just getting started. God's got great things in store for his church. Here's the good news. The church was here long before us, and the church going to be here long after us. Can't nothing stop the church. Only thing that can stop the church is you and I getting apathetic to the mission of Jesus. Only thing can stop the church is if we stop getting serious about what God has called for the church to be. So we're going to dig in our heels. We're going to dig in our heels together. Today we're in part six of our teaching series called The Secret Life. And this teaching series has been all about how to cultivate a secret hidden life in Jesus. Because the reality is, is who we are in secret, that's who we are. Who you are in secret, it's only a matter of time before it will be exposed publicly in our lives. And so we've talked about how to have this hidden secret life in Jesus that will allow us in our public lives to be able to thrive. You want to thrive in public? You got to thrive spiritually in the private areas of your life. Now, what I want to talk about today, I'm really going to be talking about for the next two weeks. It's really been a foundation that our church has been built on for the last five or six years. In fact, if you've been at Hope Church, any of our locations, for any point in time, you're going to know exactly what we're talking about today. We've been talking about there are two things that God always honors. If you're part of one of our Hope Church locations, whether you're online in Mebbin, why don't you just go ahead and yell out those two things for me. God always honors what he honors. Faith and obedience. Help me out again, say God honors. And obedience. You can write those down if you want to. God always honors faith and obedience. That's the foundation that this church is built on. We want God to bless our church. It'd be because of these two things right here. Faith and obedience. You know why God has blessed our church? Because of faith and obedience. You want God to bless your marriage, your business, your finances, your home, your, your children, whatever it is, it will be rooted in faith and obedience. And here's the reality. Faith and obedience are cultivated in private, not in public. Faith and obedience are when you and I put our head down and we honor God in faith and obedience. And in the public sectors of our life, that faith and obedience begin to show. They begin to be on display in our life. Faith and obedience are so important to every facet of our lives. Faith and obedience are so important for our lives. In fact, we're going to spend some time together today looking at this issue of faith and obedience. I'm going to be honest with you. Today's going to be a pretty intense message. Today's going to be really hard for some of us to wrestle with. In fact, some of us, our theology might get stretched a little bit. Our beliefs might get stretched a little bit. And that's okay, because really what we're going to wrestle with today is that the Bible has some really intense things to say about our faith and obedience, and whether we're really followers of Jesus or not. If you have a Bible with you, you can go ahead and get to James chapter 2. We're going to be hanging out today at all of our locations at James chapter 2. We'll flip over to 1 John, and we'll come back to James chapter 1. In James chapter 2, verse 14, I'm telling you, James is about to drop the hammer on us. So we're going to put our big girl pants on and a big boy pants on, 
Might get a little offended today, right? But that's okay, because sometimes God's truth is offensive. We got to wrestle with it today. James chapter 2, verse 14, it says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can, can that type of faith save anyone? Listen to what James says. He says, what good is it if you say you have faith, but you don't have actions that show it up? If you say, I have faith in God, but you don't live a life where your actions back that up, then what good is it to say you have faith? Can that type of faith really save anyone? Let's just start by unpacking some terms here today so we can get on the same page. We'll take some notes with us. Let's start with the word faith for just a moment. Faith means complete trust or confidence in someone or something. How many of us have faith in God today in all locations? How many of us have faith in God? You say, oh man, I got faith in God. I got confident and complete trust in God, right? In fact, if you grow up in the South for about five minutes, you say you have faith in God, right? Let's be honest, because everybody in the South is a Christian. Whether you go to church once or twice a year, or even if you just think about going to church. If you occasionally say a prayer before a meal, or when someone's on a deathbed, you call for a pastor or you pray, we're just good Christians, right? Because we all have faith, right? In fact, I don't know if you've ever met someone in the South who doesn't say they have faith in God. We all say we have faith in God. We all say that we have faith or confidence in God and who God says that he is. But then there's this action step that James says. He says, you have to have faith, plus you have to have faith in action. And he says, obedience is in action. Well, what's obedience mean? Obedience means submission to another's, help me out, what's this word? Submission to another's what? Authority. Now, this is where it gets difficult, right? Because we don't really like to submit to anyone, especially to somebody else's authority, right? We don't really like to submit ourselves to somebody else's authority. He says, listen, we can have faith, but our faith has to accompany action, has to accompany obedience. Is it really faith? Is it really faith if all you say is, I believe in something, but I don't have the action to actually back it up? But then James is going to give us an illustration. He says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. Well, you don't give that person any food or clothing. He said, what good does that actually do? He says, so, so for just a moment, say you're presented with an opportunity, a need. There's someone who doesn't have basic necessity. There's an opportunity to give and be generous. And I can argue that all of us all of us could intervene and be part of, of being part of that solution, right? And you sit there and you look at someone and you say, God bless, take care. He says, what good is that? He said, what good is it to say that you have faith and there's opportunities to live it out, there's opportunities to live it out in action and you sit idle and you don't do anything with it? He says, what good is that faith? He goes on to say this, so you see faith by itself isn't enough. Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and it's useless. So we gotta grasp this today because just believing in God isn't enough. I know that steps on some of our theology today, but just believing there is a God isn't enough. Believing that there's one God isn't enough. Just believing and having faith in God is not enough if it's not accompanied by a life that surrendered to his authority through obedience. You say, well, I don't know if I believe with that. Let me ask you this. How many of you, as kids, or you have kids who have believed in Santa Claus? How many of us? Now, your kids believe in Santa Claus, right? They believe, like, on Christmas Eve, Santa Claus is going to show up. He's going to bring me some gifts, right? Now, how many of us said this to our kids? Santa's always watching. Now, how many of your kids live their life every day as if Santa was really watching. How many of them? How many of your kids? It worked for about a minute, right? Right? They believed something, but it didn't impact their obedience day in and day out, right? So you can say, I can believe in something all day long, but if I don't live with active obedience, submission to another's authority, then James says, your faith, your faith is futile. It's, it's worthless faith is what he goes on to say. Now, some of you might disagree. 
And James was ready for a fight. James was. Not Tad. James was ready for a fight. He says, now some of you may argue. Some people have faith and others have good deeds. You may say, well, my responsibility is to have faith. Somebody else's responsibility is to have good deeds, right? He says, but, but I say this. How can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? He says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So James is just going to drill down on this. He's saying, don't tell me. Don't tell me that you have faith if you're not going to live it out. Now, I know we don't want to impact this, right? I know we don't want to get into this today, right? But let me just give you the 2021 version of this passage. He says, don't tell me you have faith in God and then you don't engage in the work of God. Don't tell me you have faith in God and you just occasionally, sporadically attend a church service. Don't tell me you have faith in God and every once in a while you toss up a prayer. Don't tell me you have faith in God, but you aren't living fully obedient lives to God. He says, don't tell me you have faith in God if you're not going to actually serve people outside of Sunday mornings. Don't tell me you have faith in God if you're not going to put God first in your finances. Don't don't tell me you have faith in God if you're not going to use the gifts and skills that God has given to you to further God's kingdom. Don't tell me you have faith in God if you're not going to commit to grow and grow with others the way Scripture has called for us to grow. He says, don't tell me you have faith in God if you and I are not going to flesh it out, put some skin in the game, get involved. Because coming to church on a Sunday and just having faith isn't enough. Now understand, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Scripture also tells us that we are not saved by our works but faith in God. So we are not trying to prove ourselves to God through good works, but it says if we are fully surrendered to him in faith, good works will be evident in our life. It will show up in our lives. Now listen, I realize today, again, for some of us, it's going to step on our toes, but let me remind you, you're not mad at Tad today. If you're upset today, you're mad at Jesus' brother James, because these are his words. So if you go home today, or you tune off today, and you're upset today, you got to wrestle with Jesus' brother. Good luck with that, right? Some of you might say, you know what? You know what? I, I truly believe, though, Tad, that I have faith that can move mountains. I have faith in God. I come into a place like this, and I worship the God of the universe, and I believe there's one true God. And James was ready for everything. Look what he says. You say you have faith, but you believe there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? James says, So you say you believe in one God? Good good for you. Even Satan and the demons believe in God. They're terrified of him. They know the power he possesses. They know the authority he carries. But you know what they haven't done? They've never surrendered to his authority and been obedient to him. He says you can believe in God all day long, but if you haven't surrendered to the authority of God, then your faith, your faith is pointless. And in verse 26, he's going to tie a perfect little bow on it. He says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also is faith is dead without good works. I mean, think about this for just a moment. I mean, James is just dropping the hammer on us to say to us today that you and I can say we have faith, but it is only evident by the lives that we live. You know what the world is sick of? When I talk about the world, you know what the world is sick of? The world is sick of a bunch of so-called followers of Jesus who have a Sunday morning faith, but they don't see evidence in our lives Monday through Saturday. The world's sick of it. They're sick of it. They're sick of us saying one thing and then living lives completely contrary to it. People are looking for real hope, real truth. They're looking for something real in our lives, something tangible to hold on to. You say, Dad, that's a lot of responsibility. Yes, it is. As followers of Jesus, we carry a big title a big spotlight. We are a reflection of Jesus to the world and our actions should back up what we say we believe. Let me give you some things to write down today that I think could just really help you out. Number one is this, you can write this down. Faith plus action equals what? Faith plus action equals what? You could say it even faster, that faith in action is obedience. When I have faith and I flesh it out, it literally is obedience in my life. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 19. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. 
so we'll be confident when we stand before God. How can you be confident one day that you will spend an eternity in a place called heaven? How can you be confident about your faith? It says that it will show up evident in the life that you live, in our secret lives, in our private lives. Am I allowing my faith to drive me to a place of being fully obedient to God in every facet of my life, in my conversations, how I talk about other people, the places that I go, the things that I watch, the things that I listen to, the things that I consume, the things that I do with my body, am I allowing those things to be evident of the God that I say that I have put my faith and my trust in? Am I living a life fully surrendered and obedient to God? See, my obedience will always be an indicator of my faith. My obedience will always be an indicator of my faith. Listen, how many of us have kids today? How many of us? How many of us have kids? I got one of my kids in the room today. And um, I will often ask my kids to do something. And it is almost shocking if they're actually obedient in the moment, isn't it? I mean, most of the time I ask them to do something, I get, oh, now, I'll do it in a minute. Why do I have to do that right now? You, you, know, you know, all know what I'm feeling right now? I mean, you ask them to do something, and it's like, I'll get to it later. I'll do something later, right? So often I ask them to do something, and they'll look at me and they'll say, why do I have to do this? And I want to look at them and say, because I'll snap your head off if you don't right now. No, but so often I'll look at my son, I'll look at other kids, and I'll say, because I want what's best for you. I just want you to trust me. I just want you to have the faith to believe that I'm not some jerk, but I actually care about you. I actually want the very best for your life. I just want you to have enough faith that you will trust me. And your obedience is evident that you actually trust me. Now see, as parents, we get that, right? God says it's the same thing in our relationship with him. Our obedience really is the greatest indicator of our faith. You can't say I got big faith, big audacious faith, but have small amount of obedience in your life. He says the obedience level of your life is determined by the faith that you say that you have, that you say you have in your life. So as parents, we understand this, that our kids need to trust us. Let me ask you this question, all of our locations. Do you trust God today? Do you trust God? All of us, oh yeah, I trust God. At what level? At what level? You want to measure your faith? Measure your obedience. How much faith do I have? I want to have, I want to have David faith. I want to have Gideon faith. I want to have Moses faith. I want to have all faith. Okay. What level of obedience do you have in your life? You can write this down. Obedience is the visible expression of invisible faith. Obedience is the visible expression. How do I know about the faith that I say? How do I know about this invisible faith? Because I can say I believe in something all day long. But you only know if I really believe in it by the expression of my life. Obedience is how we show others what we believe. Your faith will never exceed your level of obedience. Your faith will never be larger than your level of obedience. I got big faith. We should have big obedience. I don't know a whole lot about God. Well, just be obedient with what you know. I need to know more. And I'll say you better be careful about how much you want to know because you're accountable for all that you know. So the more that you know, the more accountable you are. The less that you know, hey, you're not as accountable as everybody else. I want to know more, then let's be obedient with more of what God has put in front of us, what he's entrusted us with. Because faith is just a belief, but obedience really determines what you and I believe. It shows others that we are, in fact, followers of Jesus. That's how the Bible says that God knows that our faith is really authentic or not in our life. And it's not just the visible thing the public displays of faith and obedience. It's the private displays of faith and obedience. It's who we are when no one's looking. It's the obedience in the dark areas of our life when no one's looking, when no one's watching, that really determines who we are. When you have a life of private faith and obedience, then it just naturally shows up in the public arenas of your life. I want you to think back to the Garden of Eden. God created man and woman. He created Adam and Eve in the Garden. First, two human beings. And then sin fell into the world and fractured mankind's relationship with God. I want you to ask yourself, 
Did Adam and Eve lack faith or did they lack obedience? Did they lack faith or did they lack obedience? What did they lack? What do you think it is? Disobedience. In fact, you can write this down. Disobedience fractured the relationship with God and man. This is the truth, right? It was disobedience. God gave them one, one order. He said, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, they had faith in God. There was nobody else to believe in, right? I mean, Adam had a firsthand account of watching God literally form Eve out of his body, right? I mean, he watched this take place. I would say that Adam and Eve had tremendous faith in God, but you know what they lacked? Obedience. They lacked the action to back up their faith. And because of their lack of obedience, it fractured their relationship with God. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden, the intimacy of God, with God, and they were forced to spend the rest of their lives striving and straining for what they longed for in this intimacy with God. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him, and he with them. So what it tells us is that we can only be close to God through faith in God, through Jesus. And through our obedience in God is what keeps us close to God. Because why? God cannot be in our presence when you and I are living in disobedience. Because God cannot reside in sin. That's why he had to break off that moment with Adam and Eve. He dispelled them from the garden. Why? They chose disobedience over God. Even though they have faith to believe, it fractured the relationship. Can I be honest with you? As adults, you know what we suffer with? We have tremendous authority issues. Can I be honest with you? Americans, adults, if we can't get honest about this, it's really going to be difficult for us to grasp what we're talking about today. But we have big authority issues. because We don't trust people. We don't trust people. We don't trust anybody. I don't want my boss telling me what to do. I don't want my spouse telling me what to do. I don't want my parents telling me what to do. I don't want the government telling me, dude, don't try it on me, bro. Don't try it on me, right? I don't want the church telling me what to do. I don't want a pastor to tell me what to do. I got big time authority issues. And you are crazy to think those authority issues aren't affecting your relationship with God. Jesus says that you and I are to be fully obedient to everything we read in God's word. Everything. Well, you know, I'm going to be obedient to some of it, but I don't know if I agree with all of it. I'm going to be obedient to some things, but like, there are just some issues. I just, I, I ain't going to go there. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? How, how, how can you say, I believe totally in God's truth and God's word, and yet you'll sit idle and let everybody else serve other people, and you'll sit there and say, well, I'm just here to consume from everyone else. But I guess he wasn't talking to me. I mean, how, how can you read the New Testament and see, the God has called for you to be committed to growth in every facet of your life. He's called for you to grow with others. He's called for you to put your finances first for him, to surrender to him, to give your time, your energy, your talents to serve people, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week, in every conversation, in every moment. And you say, I don't know, I just, I don't think that pertains to me. How do we reconcile that? He says we're going to be fully obedient in every aspect. Well, I'm going to be obedient to some things and just not all of them. We've talked about this many times here at Hope Church, but you can write this down. Partial obedience is full disobedience. Partial obedience is full disobedience. When I tell my kids to go upstairs at night, <laughs> brush their teeth, get their pajamas on, and get in bed, and I go upstairs and they've done one out of three, I don't throw a party for them, do I? I don't say, all right, man, you did one of the three that I asked for. Good job, man. I'm like, where's the other two? I asked you to do all three things. Now, what I'm about to say in the next few moments is probably going to be really controversial, and I'm okay with that. Because here's what I believe. When it comes to our authority issues, Jesus will look at us in Scripture and say, obey your authority. Obey your authority. Oh, I don't want to be obedient to that. See, I believe if Jesus was alive in the flesh today on this earth, there are many people at all of our locations that would actually despise him and hate him. You know why? The Jews hated him. You know why the Jews hated him? Because they were looking for a governmental warrior who was going to come wage war on the government of that day. They were looking for somebody who was going to come fight against the oppression of the Roman Empire. We act like 2020 was oppression on us. You want to know what oppression is? Read through the Bible, right? 
Read what was happening to the Jews during this day from the Roman Empire. Jesus steps on the scene and he takes off the Jewish culture because he looks at them and he says, hey, I know the Romans are stealing from you, but render to Caesar what Caesar's, and they hated him for it. They said, how dare you say that? You should stand up against the government. You should give them a big middle finger and go after them and fight them, right? And he says, no. You know the verse that says that you should go an extra mile for somebody? You know what that was in relation to? During this day, any Roman soldier could walk up to any Jew and he could take all the stuff that he was carrying, all of his armor, all of his baggage, and he could hand it to a Jew and a Jew was responsible to go at least one mile carrying that for them. And Jesus would look at every Jew and say, hey, if a Roman asks you to go one mile, go two. And they hated him for it. See, many of us today, we're upset because we look at our government as authority and we're thinking, where's the church fighting this battle against the government? And Jesus didn't even fight that battle. Because Jesus said, you know what? We're not of this world. We're not defined by this government. See, some of you, your God sitting on the throne is what's happening in Washington, what's happening with our government. Jesus says, we're not of this world. We're not of this world. Some of you, your God is what's taking place in the news every single day. It's why you're so wrapped up emotionally in what's taking place in our governmental politics. And God says, it's evident who's on the throne of your life. I wish you could have the passion for me that you have for the government policies. I wish, I wish you were so passionate about talking about me as you were arguing about politics. But we we have people who have showed up to our locations, who have walked down to our kids' areas and thrown masks at our kids' volunteers because they say, I ain't wearing no mask down the kids' hallway. Seriously? You're not even serving our kids? and you show up and abuse somebody who shows up here to volunteer and serve your kids day in and day out because you have authority issues, and then you wonder why your kid has authority issues. See, many of us today, we can't surrender to God as our authority because we have massive authority issues in our life. Jesus was our example. Jesus is what we're here to talk about today. He shows us that, you know what, there are battles worth fighting and there are some battles that really don't matter. When it comes to my kingdom, you're fighting the wrong battle. In fact, we're going to start a series the last week of this month called the Upside Down Kingdom. We're going to be talking about the upside down kingdom that Jesus came to wage war on. And it's not the kingdom that you and I are fighting for. It's a different kingdom. You can write this down today. Jesus was the perfect example of faith and obedience. He was the perfect example of faith and obedience, and he is our model. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience. He wasn't forced into obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as the perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who believe in him. It says because he was willing to choose obedience. The Bible says that he chose obedience through the things that he suffered. He suffered and he chose obedience. You think Jesus had faith in his father? You think Jesus had faith in God? Absolutely. But he was fully man as well. He had to choose a life of humility and obedience to his father. You gotta choose obedience. Obedience is hard because we have influences all around us. It's easy to say, well, Jesus is the model, but he was Jesus, he was God, but he was fully man. Listen, people who were nothing like Jesus loved Jesus. Jesus sat with sinners, but he didn't sin with sinners. Jesus sat with sinners, and they loved him, but he didn't compromise his obedience to God, and he didn't sin with sinners. We can be in this world and not of this world at the same time. We have a choice to make. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 11 says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. It means he chose obedience all the way to the cross. He was not forced to go to the cross. He didn't have to go to the cross. He chose in humility and obedience to take it all the way to a cross. And therefore, as a result of his obedience, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. 
and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus had full faith, but he married it with obedience. And as a result of his faith and obedience, God honored his faith, and God honored his obedience. And he elevated him to the name above every name. God always honors our faith and obedience. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. Listen, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God in your life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, we all became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many have been made righteous. Many have been made righteous. You can write this down. Our faith becomes perfect through obedience. Our faith is made perfect through our obedience. When you and I can take our imperfect lives and take our sin nature, and we take it to the perfect one, that is Jesus. What Jesus says is if you'll put your faith in me and you'll surrender to my authority and you'll follow me in obedience, I will then make you righteous before my Father. It's a step beyond just believing. If you believe something enough, you jump out with two feet and you say, I surrender myself to it. See, many of us have stayed put. We have a head knowledge of who God is, but we've never jumped out with two feet and we've just embraced him for who he is turned our life to him. Let me just close out for just a moment. I, I know we're kind of going a little long here today, but let me just close this out today. We'll go back to James for just a minute because James is really just gonna bring all this together for us. James chapter one, verse 22, he says, but don't just listen to God's word. Listen to what he says. Don't just listen to God's word. You must what? You must what? So don't just show up to church and listen to God's word. Don't just tune into a podcast or listen to a little Instagram clip and just listen to God's word and say, oh, that was good. He says, you gotta do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. You ever get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you're like, ooh, ooh. Now you got a choice to make. Am I gonna fix this? I'll just leave it as it is. Now, some of y'all made a choice today, and that was the wrong choice. You know what I'm saying? We got a choice to make. Like, what am I going to do about it? He says, God's word is the same way. It's like a mirror reflection. When I look at God's truth, it exposes my heart. He says, that's awesome. Now, what you going to do about it? See, it's so easy. We come to church, right? We come to church, and we're like, oh, man, that was good right there, Tad. Preach that word, bro. That was good. Amen, right? That's what amen it means. Yes, and I agree. That's some good word right there. Man, that's awesome. You stepped on my toes today. I feel good about myself. Came to church today, got my toes stepped on. I love this church. Love this place. What point is that? If you're not going to do something about it, then what point is it for you and I just to hear it? He says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will what? God will what? God will bless you for it. Bless you for it. You can write this down. Blessings always follow obedience. Blessings always follow obedience. Why? God wants your obedience because he wants your, he wants your what? He wants my money. No, he wants your heart. He wants my service? Yeah, he wants your heart. He wants my time? He wants your heart. See, some of you, you hear the wrong message. It just exposes your heart. I don't want to go to church because church talks about money. No, no, that's just where your heart is. It just exposes who your God is. The thing we're most offended about so often just exposes what the God is of our life. God wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you and I to fully surrender, to fully commit to him. Could it be you're just sitting back waiting on a blessing for God and God's just waiting for you to give him your heart? I want God to bless me and God's like, put some skin in the game, bro. Because I'm not just a genie in a bottle. I'm not just here to make your life good and give you rainbows and unicorns. I want a life of service. I want a life where you commit to me. I've laid it all down for you and I've told you, count the cost before you follow me. You're going to pick up your cross, you better know, because a builder would not build a house without first accessing the cost, right? That's a dumb plan. He says, before you say, I'm a follower of yours, I better understand, it's going to cost me my life. Am I willing to fully commit to the things of God? 
Sometimes the single greatest act of faith is just choosing to be fully obedient with where God has you right now. Aren't we people who are driven to look to the next thing? Oh, God, bless the next thing. God, just bless the next season of my life. God, I can't wait. I'll be faithful in the next season. God says, I will not bless what's next until you learn how to be faithful and obedient with what is right in front of you right now. God, I'll be obedient in this season. I want to end right there today. We're going to pick up our conversation next week on faith and obedience. I want you to understand this today. Above all today, God wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Would you give him your heart today? He wants you to have faith in him to trust that he is the God of the universe, that he sent Jesus into this world to die for you, to die for your sin. But beyond that, he wants you to embrace him and to fully surrender your heart and life to him to live a life of obedience. Not because you have to. Not because you're afraid of what he might do to you or take from you. It's willful obedience. You're willfully obedient to God because you know who he is and what he's done and what he offers you. Will you be fully obedient to him today? Let's pray together. God, today to all of our locations, God, I pray that we would choose today a posture and a heart today of faith and obedience. God, I pray we would marry our head today with our heart. And that we would fully surrender, God, our will, our ambitions, our goals to you. And that we would live a life today of full obedience to you. God, we want to see you do great things in our homes and in our lives and in our marriages and in our church. But God, it will only ever truly take place when we are willing to walk in faith, married by action and obedience. God, we may be people today who don't just say we believe something, but we actively live it out. We actively flush it out with obedience in our lives. God, we are so thankful today, God, for what you're doing, for the lives that you continue to change. Over all of our locations today, I pray that you would draw people into yourself, that people would experience you in a fresh and new way today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. However or wherever you're watching or listening, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alex and I'm the online pastor here at Hope Church. And here at Hope, we want to do whatever it takes for all people to follow, grow, and live for Jesus. And so our prayer for you here today is that you would not only feel encouraged and inspired through today's message, but that we could also help you take your next step towards Jesus today. So if today you're feeling empowered to take your next step, I wanna invite you to do one of two things. The first is to go to our website, hopechurchnc.com, and go to the Next Steps tab to sign up for Next Steps. This is a great way, whether you're in person or online, to get connected to Hope Church. And secondly, if you have a specific prayer request, a praise, or a question, you can email me at alex at hopefornc.com. I'd love to personally connect with you. And as always, if you would say that Hope Church is making an impact in your life and encouraging you in your relationship with Jesus, then I'd like to invite you to support this ministry through generosity. Week after week, we're seeing lives change because of Jesus. So we would be honored for you to partner with us as we continue to do whatever it takes for all people to follow, grow, and to live for Jesus. You can also download the Hope Church app in the App Store or Google Play Store for more resources and to stay up to date with everything that's going on here at Hope Church. We want to do anything that we can and everything that we can to help and resource you in your relationship with Jesus. Again, thank you so much for watching or listening. We hope to hear from you soon.